Welcome to Eating from the Garden. Gardening is a popular pastime shared by people of all ages. Gardens and schools are expanding nationwide and encourage children to taste and eat more fruits and vegetables. This is important because poor food choices and inadequate physical activity are contributing factors in obesity and other health issues among today's youth. Eating from the Garden is a fourth and fifth grade curriculum that provides research-based information through nutrition education and gardening activities. This program promotes gardening knowledge and physical activity, leading to increased consumption of fruits and vegetables, better food choices, and developing healthy habits to last a lifetime. Eating from the Garden is to be taught bi-weekly in the spring and fall, and monthly during the winter months. The lessons are based on a one-hour class and include additional activities when more class time is available. Nutrition and gardening lessons alternate between classroom instruction and outdoor activities in the garden. The lessons in the written curriculum start and end with the school year, giving the class the opportunity to grow both a fall garden and a spring garden. This video is a training video designed to be used when teaching educators eating from the garden. It is intended to be a supplement to the print materials and covers many of the core and optional activities in the curriculum. One more thing I want to bring up, and that is teamwork. Um, this is one of my local teacher, teachers, Joanne Cook, and she's the one I work with with Eating from the Garden. It's all about working together. Gardens is a big commitment, and you have to have that support from your local teacher. So there's many occasions, especially in th this weather, and this time of year, that it's raining. Days I have planned that we're gonna plant, I go in the classroom, it's raining that day. In that case, it falls back to, then I have to bring them out on the next day when it's nice and sunny, and I'll have my kids come out and plant with me instead of with her when she's in the room. And don't forget, it's kind of all about the partnership, working together. Hello, I'm Amy Bartels, and we're going to look at Lesson 1 in the Eating from the Garden curriculum. We're going to start with the core activity called Food for Growth. This lesson takes a closer look at where some foods come from by mapping the production history of that food. You want to show the students a picture of a familiar food and ask where the different components come from. The objective is to trace each item all the way back to plants and animals. Let's take a look at a pepperoni pizza. The crust comes from dough, which comes from plants. Tomato sauce comes from tomatoes, which comes from plants. Cheese comes from milk, which comes from a cow, but the cow must eat plants to have the energy to produce milk. So in the activity, have students write down all the foods they ate for breakfast or lunch. Next to each food, have the students note whether the food came from a plant or an animal and show how it eventually comes back to plants. Remember to eat fresh and eat from the garden. Hello, welcome back. We're going to talk about soil examination. This is an outdoor activity where you go to the garden and turn over the soil. You'll see that soil is made up of minerals, air, water, and decaying organic matter. What is the purpose of the soil? Well, soil anchors the roots, supplies water to the plants, and delivers minerals for plants' nutrients and provides air for root growth. There are three types of soil, sandy soil, that doesn't hold water. Clay soil holds water. Silty soil, which is somewhere between sand and clay. Loosen the dirt with a shovel and break up the big clumps. Either of you know why it's important to loosen the soil before we plant? So it's easier for them to come up? Absolutely, we wanna have space for those roots to be able to reach down and get the water and the nutrients out of the soil. And we also want to make sure that there's no big clumps. So if you see big clumps, you can take your hand and break them up. Or you can use your tool, either way. Soil should be dry when breaking up the surface. Otherwise, it makes clumps. Add compost to the soil to improve the structure and the nutrient level of the dirt. 
Worms can also be added to improve the soil. Fertilizer can be added if needed, mixed with water, and if you feel soil needs to be tested, check out the University of Missouri Extension. They can test the soil for you and they will let you know what the soil needs. It could take up to a month, so send it in early. Okay, this is an inexpensive kit that we recommend that you get uh, for the MPAs out in the gardens. Uh, the plastic tub is simply a cleaning tub that you can get at any store, very cheap. Uh, another thing we recommend is uh, four hand shovels uh, and then four hand rakes for the kids to be able to work in the garden. Uh, we recommend that you put some rulers uh, in the kit and some string so you can tie the string to the rulers and this is how you string your rows and measure your rows like we've showed you before. Uh, a pair of scissors is always handy because there's always something that needs cut or trimmed. You can keep some popsicle sticks in the and a marker so you can mark the rows of your garden as you're planting it. It's also good to have a clipboard that we can put our paperwork on to keep track of our produce. And last but not least, we like to keep a scale inside the tub and you can take any type of plastic shopping bag or a reusable grocery bag and hang on this and put your produce in it so you can weigh the produce and write it down onto the production sheet. Uh, it's very lightweight, it's very portable, and it's very inexpensive. So it's a good thing to have for them to carry around to their gardens. Thank you. Hello, in this lesson, Students will be identifying the parts of plants that we eat. Show students an example of each plant part. The roots absorb water and nutrients and hold plants in place. The stems transport water and provide nutrients. They provide support for the plant. The leaves make food for the plant using energy from the sun, carbon dioxide from the air, water, and nutrients from the soil. The food making process called photosynthesis also releases oxygen into the atmosphere. The flowers contain an ovary where seeds and fruits are formed. Seeds contain a complete miniature plant called an embryo. The embryo grows into a new plant when placed in the right environment. The class is then divided into five groups and you're going to give each group the Go Eat a Plant handout. Also, give the group five or six fruit and vegetable model cards. Try to make sure that you have one of each plant part if possible. Have each group determine which of the photos shows the part. Have the group hold the picture up for the rest of the class and have the class identify similarities between foods from the same plant part. Some discussion questions for the students include, what are some seeds we eat? Nuts, beans, peas, popcorn, rice? What food groups are these seeds in? Mostly meat and beans, but also grains and vegetables. What other foods are in the same food group and have similar nutrients? Meat, eggs, and poultry. What nutrients do these seeds supply? Protein, also vitamins and minerals. Remember to eat fresh and eat from the garden. Thank you. The core activity is identifying vegetables from different plants. The handout is what's inside a seed. Seeds are amazing packages of potential protected by a hard shell called a seed coat. The embryos contain the plant's first leaves and roots. The sac around it is called the cotyledon and contains the food supply for the seed. When we eat seeds, we also get the protein, vitamins, and minerals. Where are the seeds found in a plant? in the fruit. What things do we have to consider when we are planting seeds? How deep to plant them, seed spacing, and row spacing. Show students some seed packets, preferably ones being planted that day, and let them look for the information found on the back of the packet. With a partner, you're going to have them find planting depth, seed spacing, and row spacing information for the seeds they will be planting. Planting depth depends on the seed's size 
and how much light it needs during germination. Small seeds, like lettuce, should be barely covered. Large seeds are usually planted two to three times deeper than their width, not length. Always read the packet, as there can be exceptions. What happens when you plant seeds too deep? Seeds may rot in the soil, or plants that are too young may use up their food reserves before they reach the light and begin to make their own food. Seed spacing. Seeds that are planted too close together may not get enough light, water, or nutrients, so they won't produce very well. Large seeds like beans or corn are fairly easy to space, but small seeds are more difficult to handle. You may need to thin or pull some of the seedlings or young plants after they begin to grow. Now row spacing is important for the same reasons as seed spacing. Go outside and demonstrate how to plant the turnips or other seeds and ask volunteers to help create a string marker for your garden row. All right, kids, you've got your shovel set aside. Now I'm gonna hand you each a rake and I want you to just smooth this area out just like you're uh, icing a cake. We're gonna get ready to plant. Very good. The reason we don't want any low spots or any holes in our soil is what would happen when it rains? Where would the it water go? go to in the middle. Hole. You're right, the water would go right to that hole. So we wanna make sure it's nice and smooth before we put our seeds in. Here's the next thing we're gonna use. I've got a couple rulers and some string. I want you to put yours in right about where your hand is, Jasmine. You can put it right against the edge of the, of the garden. And then I want you to unwind yours. And you do the same thing straight across from her. Yep, just push those down in. We're gonna use this string so that we know where to dig our row when we're planting our seeds. Why do you think it's important to plant our seeds in a nice straight row? What do you think? So maybe like you know where they are or something? Absolutely. So you wanna know where you start in planting things in the garden because otherwise, when the rain or the wind or birds or insects come and your garden gets all jumbled up, you wanna know where you've started. So we're gonna plant a nice straight row. All right, so. I want you, we're going to plant some radish seeds. I want you to take your shovels and you're going to both meet your shovels right in the middle. So reach your arms out and meet right in the middle. And then you're going to dig, just use this string for your guide and just pull your shovel back all the way to your stick. When you get to the edge, just push that dirt right out of the way. Now we're going to plant the seeds. It tells us on the back how far apart we need to plant them. But we're gonna overplant because in the gardens, we wanna be able to, in a few weeks, teach you how to thin. So, I want you to start at the middle, and I want you to start at the middle, and I want you to spread those seeds all the way back to your ruler. Nice job. Now, we're gonna use your hand, and I just want you to cover your row. Just pull the dirt and cover up your row of seeds. Firming that soil takes over the seed and helps speed up the growth of the plant. The soil helps seeds stay moist after watering or rain. All right, now you've planted your row. I want you to lay a ruler down with the one touching the end of your ruler. So you wanna lay it down just like that. Good job. Before we take our row out, want to go ahead and mark it and we planted radishes so why don't you put that in right about where that row is at good job now pick up your stick with the string on it and we're going to move it down and find the six inches on your ruler good job now we're ready to dig another row so you can go ahead and grab your shovels do the same thing you did on the first row seeds can also be planted in pots in the classroom and be sure to place them in a warm, sunny location and water regularly. You wanna check plants planted earlier to see if they need thinning. Also, you wanna look for weeds that need to be removed. Check to make sure all plants have enough water. Review the tip sheet, watering plants, for watering techniques, and complete the classroom care garden chart for information on these seeds and others planted earlier. That's all for the seeds we eat. Thank you.
Lesson three, fruit and veggie wash. This is a core lesson. For this lesson, you're going to lay out five or more fruits and vegetables, like a banana, apple, carrot, lettuce leaves, and a potato. Apply glow germ onto the fruits and vegetables. Explain that the powder represents contaminants that get on our fruits and vegetables. And ask students what contaminants might those be, like bacteria, mold, pesticides, or fertilizers. Have the students look at these fruits and vegetables under a black light to see what the contaminants look like before washing. So you'll have a volunteer student peel the banana and then place it on a plate. The second student will peel the carrot. The third student will peel the apple and wash it. The fourth student will rinse the lettuce leaves. And then the fifth student will wash and scrub the potato. Now have the students look at each fruit and vegetable under the black light again and see if they can still see the glow germ on the food. Why might they still see that powder? Well, there are several possibilities. Peeling helps, but germs got on hands and transferred back to the fruit or vegetable. They did not wash again or didn't wash at all, or they didn't scrub the fruit or vegetable. For this activity, you could also Use a non-fat cooking spray on the fruits and vegetables and sprinkle it with cinnamon. After washing, there should be no residue or no smell of cinnamon. Do make sure that if you're using real fruits for these that you throw them away after you do this example. We don't want to put these in the compost if you're using glow germ or um, powder because those contaminants um, might hurt your garden. Thank you and remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. In this lesson, students will see how well they actually washed their hands after rubbing a small amount of either glow germ or hand lotion mixed with fluorescent paint or even cooking spray and cinnamon on them, have them wash their hands. Now make sure they rub it in well on both the tops and the bottoms, kind of like they're rubbing in some lotion. Then they'll look at their hands under your black light to see the germs that they need to get rid of. And then you'll send the students to wash their hands again and look under the black light to see how well they did. We're stressing the importance of hand washing with this entire activity. If you're running short on time, you might select a few students to demonstrate this activity. And remember, if you're using the cooking spray and cinnamon, it's not going to show up on the black light. So you're looking for both the smell and the flecks of cinnamon for the child to remove. All right, thank you and have fun. Hello, let's talk about weeds. What is a weed? It is any plant that is growing where it's not supposed to, and often at a faster rate than the seeds we intentionally planted. Weeds can compete with fruits and vegetables for nutrients, water, and sunlight. Before going into the garden to pull weeds, we need to make sure that we're really removing weeds, not the vegetables that we have planted. Consult a local master gardener or a good reference book for a picture of weeds. Some common weeds are dandelion, carpet weed, white clover, bindweed, crabgrass, ragweed, and spurge. Go out to the garden and demonstrate weeding and then have students weed the garden. And you can also refer to the tip sheet weeding. And as you go along, be sure to record the development of the garden on the classroom garden care chart. All right, lesson four, nutrients we need. We're gonna have a discussion with kids. Food provides our bodies with many different nutrients. Does anyone know what a nutrient is? Has anyone seen the list of nutrients on food labels? You can show a package um, or just some labels. I cut some off and did not show the name brand, so it's just the Nutrition Facts label. Nutrients are substances that our bodies need to help us do the things that we do every day. They give our bodies energy, they help us grow, and they keep us healthy. There are six different classes of nutrients. Our bodies need all six types of nutrients, which can be found in many different foods. 
So we're going to look at the six nutrients. We'll use the nutrient table, which is a teacher reference, and then the handout to each student's called Nutrients We Need. You'll have one student read aloud from the Nutrients We Need handout the information about one nutrient at a time. And you'll mention to the students that the foods associated with the nutrient, like where would you find the nutrient on the plate of spaghetti, there may be more than one food per nutrient. You'll write in the box where you would find the nutrient. You can make an overhead transparency if desired, and then you'll just repeat that for each nutrient. Remember, there are six. Remember to eat fresh and eat from the garden. This lesson is a discussion of what things plants and people need for growth. So you're going to do some comparing and contrasting with students out at the garden. I like to try to do this one outside if possible. So you want to talk about three major things, food, water, and air. Why do we need them? And then you can compare and say, why do plants need them? Food. We get our food from plants and animals. Plants make their own food from carbon dioxide in the air, water and light through photosynthesis, and plants also need other nutrients that can be found in the soil. Explain that we'll learn more about the process of photosynthesis in a later lesson. We need water, and plants need water to grow. They pull it in from the soil through their roots. I like to stretch my arms out and have the kids stretch their arms out and see if they can absorb some vitamin D. Then let's talk about the air. Plants need carbon dioxide from the air and they release oxygen for us to breathe during photosynthesis. This is where I mentioned that talking to your plants is actually a good thing. What might we also need to be healthy that plants don't? And this is where you can bring in exercise and sleep. And kids will think it's funny that plants don't sleep. Is there anything else that plants need? Sunlight. We also need sunlight. It gives us vitamin D for our bones to keep us healthy. The sun provides plants with the energy needed to complete the process of photosynthesis. That's all for plants and people. Thank you. All right, lesson four is about plants and nutrients. So in this lesson, we will discuss how people need nutrients to be healthy, and so do plants. Why do plants need nutrients? They need them to grow. How do they get those nutrients? Well, they get carbohydrates made in their leaves through the process of photosynthesis. Those carbohydrates include the sugar that the plant makes and uses for food and are a source of energy for the plant. They need minerals, which are taken up from the soil through the roots. Plants need minerals to grow. They also need proteins and fat. Nutrients are manufactured by plants, and the plants only make what they need. Vitamins are made by the plants using carbohydrates, water, mineral, and sunlight. And then water, which is brought up through the plant, through the roots and the soil. The plants need water to maintain a relatively constant temperature and to carry those other nutrients, just like we do. If you have additional time, or depending on your class, you can discuss the minerals specifically that are needed by plants. Nitrogen, which helps plants grow and stay green. Phosphorus, which helps plants to develop strong roots. Potassium helps plants grow and avoid infection. And then composting and worms will help replenish the soil with those necessary minerals. At this time, if you're not already outside, you can go outside and check to be sure that the plants have enough water and that those beds are weeded. You can also discuss with the teacher and the classroom the additional needs while you're not there. If some of the vegetables are ready for harvesting, continue with the next steps. If not, you can just wait until the next lesson. Thank you. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Here's a tip. If your plants are ready to harvest, we suggest doing these garden activities first. Then do the nutrition lesson while the vegetables cook. And then you can use vegetables as a tasting activity. Why is it important to know when to harvest produce? Well, vegetables that are too big have fewer flavors than normal sized vegetables. The quality of the vegetable degrades 
when they are left in the garden too long. Vegetables picked too late can be tough, mushy, rotten, or tasteless. And of course, vegetables that are picked too early lack flavor or taste unripe. Time for the harvest depends on the climate, the vegetable, and also the variety of vegetable. Tomatoes, for example, can be left on the vine until fully ripe, or you can pick them partially mature, and they will continue to ripen. To determine when vegetables have reached their peak quality, use the handout to pick or not to pick, and use MU Extension Publications Vegetables, Harvest, and Storage. Look for damage. Never eat decayed or rotten vegetables. Check your garden frequently for ripe produce during harvest time. Be sure to pick the ripe vegetables carefully so as not to damage them. Remember, ripe vegetables have a short storage time. So when it's time to go out to the garden with your students and harvest some vegetables, record what was done on the classroom garden care chart. Students know that they need a variety of foods daily to be healthy, but how do they know which foods and how much to eat? You're going to use the current food graphic in either a poster form or in a handout. This is a guide that's used to make healthy decisions. Point out to students that some of the sections are bigger than others and ask students why they think that's true. Well, this indicates that we should eat more foods from the vegetable and grain groups. They're low in fat and sugar, but they're high in fiber. All food groups are equally important. Just because the size of the food section is larger does not mean that it's more important. We just need to eat more food from that food group. We should eat more foods in each food group that are low in fat and sugar. You can show an example of an apple. It's low in fat and sugar and it has a lot of nutrients. But if we make that apple into a pie, we add sugar and fat. It's okay to occasionally have a piece of pie, but it's just healthier to eat the apple. So let's move on to a food group classification and location activity. You're going to divide students into five or six groups and give each student a stack of food cards and a copy of a blank food graphic poster. So you can use these types of handouts and this poster might be a good use for discussion. You're going to review each food group one at a time. You want to talk about what specifically is in each food group and make sure that students have a good understanding. Have students lay their food model card from each food group on the poster as discussed. Using those handouts, discuss with the class why foods belong to particular groups, why we need those foods, and what other foods might possibly fall into that group. You can check for student comprehension of this information by using those review questions on the last page of this discussion. Or, and, and this lesson is a handy way to reinforce that kids need a variety of foods from all five food groups. Don't forget, eat fresh and eat from the garden. All right, this lesson is about parts of the seed and how they travel from place to place. You're going to review with the students the handout What's Inside a Seed from Chapter 2. Go over the seed parts and what the purpose of each is. Now we're going to discuss with the students the germination process. Kids love this activity and this is one really I suggest you don't miss. So have some soaked beans for students to take apart to find the parts of the seed. I use dried beans, the larger the better. You're going to use white beans or um, a red bean, and they're very inexpensive, just dried beans in a bag. You're going to have the extra soaked beans and some magnifying glasses on hand to be helpful for the project. The idea is that the kids peel the seed coat off, which you've softened, and then they take both seeds halves apart, and they're looking for those seed parts inside that correspond with their handout. I always have kids journal about what's going on in the garden 
And the seed activity is really a good one that you could also adapt and use inside the classroom on a rainy day. Don't forget, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Thanks. All right, now we're going to talk about some food group meals. In this lesson, you want to have the students write down their favorite meal before the lesson. After the students have discussed the food groups, you're going to have them compare their meal to the current recommendations. You want to encourage students to substitute other favorite foods so that the meal includes a food from each food group. This is another opportunity to talk about foods that are high in fat, high in salt, or high in sugar things that we don't necessarily want added into our foods and that keep a lot of our foods from being healthy. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Explain to students that there is something else they will need to do with their teacher after harvesting vegetables. The garden needs a last tending before winter comes. We need to pull all of the plants and weeds. We need to rake any fallen fruits or vegetables. We can add all these materials to our compost pile if available. Spread fallen leaves over the garden to a depth of two inches. Turn the leaves into the soil with a spading fork and smooth the soil. Then we have put our garden to bed for the winter and we begin planning for the next spring garden. Go out to the garden and harvest some vegetables. Record what was done in the garden on the classroom garden care chart. Also record produce harvested on the produce chart. Prepare foods for sampling like quick sauteed greens or other recipes to use what was harvested from the garden. All right, this is a portion size activity. You're going to go back and review Lesson 5 by asking some of those review questions. In Lesson 5, we talked about the current food graphic and the food groups. And now we're going to identify the amount of food from each food group a person needs each day. So to do this lesson, you can see I've brought a lot of props. There's some prep that you'll need to do before starting this lesson. As a time saver, something to note you can use rubber bands to represent the cooked pasta. Now here's how this will work. I've used my food models which correctly portion out cereal, pasta, and milk. Go ahead and get those together. If you want to use the real thing, you can. And then you're going to hide those from students. Over here, you're going to have empty containers and you'll have a container with cereal, a container with pasta or rubber bands, and probably a pitcher of water. The idea is the students will pour the things into each container on what they think they might eat. So the first part of this lesson, you're going to have a student pour water, and you might have another student pour cereal, and then another student pour pasta into these containers to show again how much they think that they might consume or what they think a serving size might be. All right, after the students have measured out what they think is the correct portion size, you're going to show them the food models that you already prepped so that they see a comparison in the correct portion size for each of the items, the milk, the cereal, and the pasta. Here's where you can have a discussions with students about the amount of each food from the food groups that we need to eat and you can use food models if possible. For instance, grains come in six ounce equivalents. Vegetables come in two, two and a half cups. Fruit, one and a half cups. Dairy, three cups. And protein, five ounce equivalents. So how do we know how much we're eating if we don't measure our food? Distribute the portion sizes are in your hand handout and show the students that you can use your hand to help judge amounts. There's some really good hands-on things that you can bring in, such as a deck of cards and their hand. 
our goal should be to eat these amounts each day from each of the five food groups. If we're still hungry, we should continue to eat a variety of foods from each of the food groups. Why do we need to watch our portion sizes? Well, we're seeing too much obesity today from eating too many foods and not burning enough calories in physical activity. We get a lot of our calories from snacks and fast food. We also don't eat many fruits and vegetables, which are naturally low in fat and sodium. They fill you up with a lot of, uh, without a lot of extra calories. Don't forget to answer those review questions to make sure that kids comprehended all that you showed them. They enjoy the hands-on and the, vis the visual of this lesson. Thank you. Don't forget, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Hi there, this lesson is all about proper snack sizes. This makes a great visual about fat and sugar content in foods. So you want to divide the class into groups of two and distribute packages or pictures of different snack foods. Give each group at least two sizes of foods. Have them look at the number of grams of sugar listed on the nutrition facts label and divide by four. Four grams of sugar equals one teaspoon of sugar. Have them count out the number of sugar packets or cubes that are in the packages. You're going to have them look at the number of grams of total fat as well on the nutrition facts label and divide by four again. Four grams of fat equals one teaspoon of fat. Have them measure out the teaspoons of fat and place them um, out next to their label. Have each group share with the class the food, including the different sizes that, that they are comparing, and show the sugar and fat in each size. Now I've brought my fat cubes and my sugar so that you can use those as again a hands-on. You want to discuss the observations. Did it make a difference if the package was large or small? Would you eat the whole package? Could you eat less or maybe share it with a friend? Were there some foods that would be better to eat in larger portions if you were hungry? For example, pretzels or a bagel. This lesson is hands-on. You want to give the kids lots of opportunities. These cards are great to use because they're familiar snack foods. Remember, the whole idea is showing them about portion and about control and moderation. Remember to eat fresh and eat from the garden. Thanks. Hi, my name is Tammy Culpepper, and we're going to look at Lesson 7, Fruits and Veggies. More matters. Remember to always review the past lessons before beginning the next one. This will help students recall information from the previous lesson and apply it to the new lesson. The first activity is talking about the colors of the rainbow. Students are then asked to name different fruits and vegetables that match the colors of a rainbow. Discuss what nutrients we get from fruits and vegetables like, for example, vitamin A and vitamin C, calcium, iron, and fiber. Not only are fruits and vegetables good for us, but most are fat-free, sodium-free, and low in calories. Tell students about photochemicals, which are also come from fruits and vegetables. These are substances that help our future health. Many will help prevent diseases like heart disease, diabetes, and some cancers. Remind students they need vegetables five times a day and fruit three times a day. Have students name a time during the day they could add one more fruit or one more vegetable. Use different gadgets or materials to reinforce what nutrients do for our body. For example, you can use a flashlight to talk about vitamin A and how it helps our eyes to see in the dark. Vitamin D with the Legos, your building blocks, etc. Different examples work for the different nutrients. They're all used just to reinforce the job nutrients play in our body. Taste testing is another good one to bring up at this point. Many students may not have had a chance to eat a kiwi. This would be a good opportunity to let them see it. Fill it, see the shape, and taste it. If that's not available, pick any other fruit that might interest the students. Next is the Jeopardy game, and I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite games to play with them. This is a fun game to use as a review activity. You copy cards, two-sided, laminate, and cut apart. 
then divide the class into groups of three or four. All you have to do is cut it right out of the curriculum, put it on the front, put the question and answer on back. Really simple. Laminating it though is a great way to protect it. That way they last a long time. The first group picks a category like dark green and the number of points their team wants to try for. The instructor selects the card from the pile selected. Correct answers receive the amount of points on the card. Incorrect answers get no points. And the next team can try to answer the que question correctly for the points. If they get it correct, they get the points. Just remember, it's a fun game to play, especially on a rainy day. It can also be added to use as well. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Organic matter is broken down when microscopic organisms like bacteria and fungi feed on the dead materials. The material decays and breaks down into rich dark hummus that provides nutrients plants need. Show them tip sheet eight, the composting poster. It explains how composting works. Some minerals that plants need are nitrogen that helps plants grow and stay green. Phosphorus, that helps plants develop strong roots. Potassium, that helps plants grow and avoid infection. Add compost to the soil by mixing it together before planting seeds or transplants. Compost can be used as a mulch. Things that can be composted are fruits, and vegetable scraps, eggshells, coffee grounds, nutshells, weeds, leaves, wood chips, hay, manure, ash, and shredded paper. Things that you should not compost are meat, bones, dairy products, oils, and fats. Tip sheet eight is the recipe for compost. You can use this to explain the process to your students. To make a good compost, there needs to be four elements. The energy source is called the browns. These include dried leaves, hay, and wood chips. Should be about 50 to 70 percent of the pile. These are energy foods for the compost organisms. They are high in carbon and carbon dioxide gas. The protein source is called greens. The greens, vegetable pills, eggshells, coffee grounds, etc. These ingredients are high in nitrogen and should make up 30 to 50 percent of the pile. The greens are fresh, damp material that decompose rapidly on their own. Nitrogen is an element of protein that the animals need. Mix completely or layer with the browns. The compost pile needs a good balance of browns and greens for the proper decomposing. Too much of one or the other will slow down the decomposing. Water is important for moisture, which is needed for decomposition. Without moisture, the pile dries out. Nothing will happen. Add water when you add items to the pile. Too much water, like heavy rains, can push out the air needed for decomposition. Air is also important for decomposition. Oxygen is needed for the breakdown. Adding too many greens without mixing them in can also push out the oxygen. It is important to stir or turn your compost pile regularly to improve the oxygen level. So that pretty much covers composting have fun, and remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. This is lesson eight, what's on a label. Start this lesson by reviewing the past lessons, which would be plant parts, six major nutrients, five food groups. This lesson is about reading and understanding a food label. Make sure to either have real labels or copies of labels. 
Go over the different information on a label. For example, serving size, calories, total fat, percentage of daily value, soda, sodium, etc. Also go over what percent you want high and which nutrients you want to reach at 100% daily. Use the food label activity sheet, which is in the curriculum, that looks like this. It is the 100% whole wheat bread. This is also a good time if you're going to bring in something to bring in 100% whole wheat bread also and let them see the label and maybe even try the bread as well. This is a good sheet for them to actually be able to look over all the information and in the order in which it shows up on a label. Having them look through the label is great. Following the activities, you can also do the fruit tasting where you would cut up a mango and give each student a sample to try. It's a great way for them to try something different and still be cost effective in your taste testing. Okay, now let's talk about the restaurant nutrition. You can collect various restaurant menus and compare the foods on the basis of their nutrition content. Answer the questions at the end of this activity that's on one of the handouts that you will also have. It's a great way for the kids to realize the nutrition value in some of the foods that they're eating out also. There are a lot of ways to do a garden plan. In the curriculum, we show square feet plans. But it depends on the time of the year, the size of the garden, and the seeds that you pick. This could be raised beds, large or small, or even tubs or pallets. Read the back of the seed package to see if the container you have selected is big enough for the seeds needed to grow. Pick the seeds that best fit in the space you have to work with. You can also read through seed catalogs to find this information. When all plans are done, have students copy what they have planned onto the board or a paper. Hand out the garden plan. Other things to consider before picking the seeds are the hardiness zones, the frost-free date for spring, cool and warm season plants, and is water available? We want to make sure the vegetables will grow in our area, so we need to check the seed package to determine the right time to plant seeds. This is lesson nine, get physically active. Start the lesson by reviewing the food label information from the last lesson. This is a good time to ask the students if they've read la labels, if they got any information off the label. This lesson, though, is about physical activity and the importance of water. Discuss with students that we need water, exercise, food, and air to keep healthy. There are two types of activities we need to do each day. There's mental activity, which puts our minds to work, and physical activity, which puts our bodies to work. Tell your students that the heart is a muscle and we want to keep it healthy. In this section, students learn how to take their pulse. There is a handout that goes with this to do as well. Everyone at this time needs to be very still and quiet. That way they will be able to listen. Apply pressure, but do not push too hard. Place two fingers gently on one side of the neck, just below the chin and off to the side. It sometimes helps to start by grabbing your earlobe and then sliding your two fingers down the underside of your jawbone to your throat. Can you, can you feel your pulse? Sometimes students have trouble with this one, so we go to the second one. The palm of your hand up, slide two fingers of the opposite hand down the side of the thumb to the wrist. You will notice a small groove just on the underside of your wrist, below the heel of your hand by the thumb. Can you feel your pulse here? Most times, the students will be able to feel this one, but in case they can't, sometimes I will help them or I'll have them do a few jumping jacks, something to kind of get their blood pumping, and there, sometimes they can feel it better after that way. This lesson goes through why warm-ups are important and gives examples of some for students to do. You're gonna review with them why it is important to drink 
plenty of water while stretching and exercise. Another thing at this time is to brainstorm or discuss why we need water and how that compares to why and how plants also need water. Explain the difference between aerobic and anaerobic types of exercising. The importance of cooling down reminds students that they need 60 minutes of physical activity every single day. There is a handout, Physical Activity Crossword Puzzle, that is a really good worksheet to use as a review of the physical activity at this time. At this point, it's a good time to do the taste testing. Many students may not have ever had jicama, so it would make a good choice for the taste testing. I know I have actually used it before in class and are very surprised that the kids really do enjoy it. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. There's an old saying in real estate, location, location, location. The same is true for gardening. Discuss with the students that gardening is a great form of physical activity. It helps build muscles and use up calories. What should we know before choosing what vegetables we will grow in our garden? What vegetables do you like to eat? The zone we live in and what the frost-free dates are. The length of the growing season the time of year you can plant and maintain a garden, the vegetables that grow best in your area, the dimensions of the space you have available to use, some other things to consider, pests that are a problem in your area. Will you need a fence? Water, is there a nearby source? The garden will need to be watered weekly. Will the garden drain well so that it doesn't drown the plants? Sunlight, will the garden get enough sun? Most of the garden likes full sun for at least six to seven hours. Tool and equipment storage, where can equipment be stored? Is it close to the garden? Students will look at the garden plan and answer the last three questions about sunlight, water, and drainage for their gardens. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Hi, this is lesson 10 called Eat Smart, Play Hard. Start this lesson by reviewing the importance of physical activity while drinking plenty of water while exercising and having students check their pulse. They would have done this from the previous lesson, so it should get a little bit easier now for them to be able to do this. This lesson is all about setting and reaching reasonable goals. Have the class discuss what some of those things they remember about healthy eating healthy foods. For example, make half your grains whole. Switch to low fat or fat free. Drink more water and less sugary drinks. One of the optional activities at the end of this lesson actually compares fat and sugar content in snack items that students are familiar with. Students actually measure out the fat content in the form of shortening and sugar in various foods by using the nutrition facts labels. For example, you can have them measure it out or you can actually already have it measured out. For this one, I show how much fat is in a small bag of chips and how much fat is in just a little bit larger size bag of chips. It's a great way for them to also see that sometimes it's not doing without doing with maybe a little bit less of it, a little smaller bag. Then when you move to the sugar, I like for them to actually bring in their own labels. That way it's foods that they're familiar with or drinks. So when I bring in, have them bring in their labels, they actually get to measure in the sugar as well. We've already talked about that four grams equals one teaspoon. So all I have them do is figure up, do the math and find out how many teaspoons of sugar is in their favorite food. So if it has four grams, it's one teaspoon. Eight, 12, and so on. 16, you can see with just 16 grams, it looks like a plate of sugar. For them, 
It's the visual of how much sugar is in that one item that they are eating. And for most of them, it's an item they've chosen that they eat on a regular basis. And at this time, you would hand out the goal setting worksheet and have students complete it along with the My Activity Log, which can be ordered from the MU Extension publication. The taste testing activity would come next. For this lesson, they usually make the guacamole. This recipe is found in the recipe section of the curriculum and is a great activity. Most of them have never made guacamole before, and so it's a great one to have them do with you. Hi, this is lesson 11. We need a garden plan. Begin the lesson by reviewing the goals students set in Lesson 10. Did they reach their goals? Did they reach 60 minutes a day of physical activity? Also a good time to review photosynthesis with them and how a plant converts energy from the sun into food for a plant. Discuss with students what can be done if you harvest more fruits and vegetables then you can eat before they go bad. Is there a way to save them? It's a good question for them and you'll get lots of good answers. Review the importance of always washing fruits and vegetables before eating them. Explain where to store different produce and why. Present information to students on canning and freezing and the pros and cons for both. A good visual to show them, if you can, is a jar of home canned food. Most of them have never seen it before. Have them actually do the activity of freezing grapes. It's a little bit different for them, and it's also a good way for them to learn how to do it. Most kids love frozen grapes. Explain that there are different types of bags for different reasons, and why the freezer bag works best when you're putting the produce in the freezer. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Hello again. Now it's time to discuss the classroom garden plan. Use the garden map drawn on the board or poster to plan the school's garden. Each square on the board represents a square foot in the garden. Show students the laminated garden plans from Lesson 8 to give them ideas of how their plan can be drawn. Make a list of the seedlings and seeds that can be planted in the garden. Use a symbol for each of the vegetables. Refer to square off your spring garden to show how many seeds or seedlings should be placed in a square foot of the garden. Draw in the vegetable symbol for each seed or seedling that would be planted to the garden on the classroom garden map. It is a good idea to place one or two extra seeds in each spot. If all the seeds do germinate, all but one plant can be removed. This is called thinning. So now we're talking about the importance of thinning our plants. And here we have two rows of radishes. Uh, one row was done right. Uh, and one row was too close and we did that on purpose so you could see what happens if you don't thin your plants properly. So when we pick some of the radishes that wasn't thinned properly, they're just long skinny roots and that's all they're ever going to be until we thin them out. Uh, so all those radishes we planted, uh, we're not going to get anything good to eat off that because they're just going to be long and skinny. But for the row that we planted correctly, you can see we get some really nice radishes. And what these guys are going to do is go ahead and harvest some of these good radishes. So, and you can tell when it's ready to go because part of the radish will be sticking out of the ground. So do you guys want to go ahead and pick those ones that need harvest? Yeah. So that's how we make a classroom garden plan. Remember to eat fresh and eat from the garden. what we're going to do is we're going to show how you take a store-bought potted tomato and put it in your garden. So if you guys want to pick up your pots, 
And the first thing we're gonna do is we have to peel that paper off. Now what are we gonna have to do with the paper? Throw it away. We're gonna have to throw it away. So we're gonna set it down out of the way for right now, but the paper has to be thrown away. Now they're gonna tell you you can plant the whole pot, but we don't want to, and I'm gonna show you why. So we're gonna peel this pot off. So we're just gonna get all that peeled off. What can I do with the pot? What do you think I can do with the pot? We could, we're gonna compost it. So if I have a compost barrel, I can put it in a compost barrel. If I don't have a compost barrel, I can just throw it out on my garden, okay? So I don't have to do anything with it. But if you'll look, all our roots are going around in a circle. And if I would have planted that down in the ground with the pot still in it, they still would have went around in circles. So what I have to do is I gotta give it a massage. So just hold it over the garden and just lightly pinch. And you're gonna hear some of those roots rip and that's all right, you're not hurting it a bit, okay? So now if you look at it, my roots are coming down. Instead of going around in a circle, they're coming down. And that's all we have to do. You can be a little more aggressive, pinch it a little harder. There you go. Dig a hole for the seedling, two times the size of the root ball on the plant. And we're gonna take our shovels and we're trying to make a hole the same size of our tomato roots or a little deeper because with tomatoes we can go a little deeper and we're all right. We're going to pick up our tomatoes and we're going to put them down in our holes and then when we know they're straight we can just take our fingers and we can break up these clumps and we can just start filling our tomatoes up. And with our tomatoes like I said it doesn't matter if your hole's deeper than your tomato because the stem of the tomato when it gets into dirt will start growing extra roots. So it doesn't hurt it for it to be in the ground. And then we're just going to pat it down a little bit all the way around. And then we'd want to give it a good healthy drink. And we got our tomatoes planted. Water the garden after planting. Be careful not to wash away the seedling. You can tell you have the right amount of water if the water feels moist like a sponge. Students can do the water test by sticking a finger into the soil and if it feels moist as deep as the plant's roots, it has enough water. Once the roots have grown, make sure to water deeply and thoroughly so the roots can grow the right depth. Label the rolls either with popsicle or wood craft sticks at the beginning of the row so the students remember what you planted and where. After the garden is planted, students need to observe water, weeds, and harvest. Each time students work in the garden, they should fill out the classroom garden care chart. And remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Lesson 12, consumerism. Start lesson by reviewing and maybe even eating the frozen grapes from the last lesson. What were the other ways to store and preserve fruits and vegetables? Just kind of going over with them and reviewing that can be a big help. This lesson though is all about advertising and how it affects our choices and what we choose to eat or drink. Discuss different techniques or tools that companies use to try and get the target audience to buy and use their product. Show them different types of advertisements. There is a handout that goes with this part, which is great for them to use. Next comes the taste testing, the spinach leaves. The spinach strawberry salad is different for many of the students, and they were, are surprised at how much they like it. The recipe can be found in the recipe section of the curriculum. Also, at this time might be a good time to remind you that you can do some substitutions. For example, when strawberries are not in season, I use apples at this time, especially if I'm making this recipe in the fall. So just remember, sometimes substitutions can work really good when it comes to some of these recipes. Remember, eat fresh and eat from the garden. Let's go bug hunting. Take the students out to the garden and have them look for bugs. Collect some insects from the garden beginning in the morning 
when most creatures are out in the garden. When you find an interesting creature, gently place it in your bug box with a few leaves and a little twig to make it feel at home. Use a book on collecting and identifying insects like Insects of North America. Now, let's take a closer look. Show the class insects you have brought in and leaves that have been damaged by pests. Have a label on each insect with its name, what it eats, and where it lives. Allow students to pass the containers around or come up and examine them. Ask, what difference do you see in the insects? What's similar? What is the main difference between the insect and the spider? What do they eat? Some insects suck plant juices, some eat leaves, and some eat other insects. And that's all for our big bug hunt. So this is our lettuce, and our lettuce is ready to harvest. And what we're gonna do when we harvest our lettuce is we take a handful, we go down about two inches from the ground, and we just give it a haircut. It doesn't matter if we get some bugs or some grass, because when we get back inside, we'll wash it out and rinse it out and make sure it looks good. And we're just gonna put it in here. It's harvest time. Review with students why it's important to know when to harvest produce. We like to grow big vegetables, but we don't want to sacrifice taste. The quality of the vegetables deteriorate when they are left in the garden too long. Vegetables picked too late can be tough, mushy, rotten, or tasteless. Vegetables picked too early lack flavor or taste green or unripe. Here are three important things to remember during harvest to ensure your vegetables are great tasting. Harvest your produce at the right stage of maturity. Handle the vegetables gently. Store your vegetables in a cool place soon after harvest. The time for harvesting depends on the climate, the variety, and the vegetables involved. For example, tomatoes can be left on the vine until fully ripened or harvest when partially mature. Other crops like winter squash and watermelon are not ready to harvest until after they are fully developed on the vine in the garden. Review the phrase, days to maturity, and where can students find information about vegetables they are growing. Determining when vegetables have reached peak quality is not easy. Know what your fruits and your vegetables should look like when they mature. Review, to pick or not to pick, and use MU Extension publication, Vegetables Harvest and Storage. Look for damage. Some vegetables are more easily damaged during harvest than others, but we should be careful not to bruise or cut any vegetables. Check your garden frequently during harvest for ripe produce. After all vegetables are harvested, it is time to put the garden to bed. Most gardens are put to bed in the fall, but the school gardens that you will be doing are put to bed at the end of the school year. After the rest of the vegetables are harvested, plant sweet potatoes in the garden. They will require very little care and will produce sweet potatoes in the fall for the next year's students. Thank you for watching. Let Eat Fresh Eating from the Garden be your slogan for a healthy lifestyle.